Hi everybody, it's Tara Green here. I'm going to talk about the big Scorpio lunar eclipse coming up May the 5th. It's at, it peaks at 1.34 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, and this chart is set for Washington, D.C., so there will be different ascendants depending on where you are. It's a very long penumbral. It's not a total lunar eclipse. Um, it's very long. It's going to last almost four hours. Uh, it won't be visible in North and South America, so we won't see it, but we will still feel it. Now, where an eclipse is totally visible are the areas of the country and of the world that are affected the most. So that's Australia, uh, China, really parts of Russia and uh, Asia are going to be affected the most. So you can look up your own local time to see when the eclipse is falling where you are. So now I have drawn in extra and made them bold here, uh, the aspects between the planets and added in extra things. So of course, it is a full moon in Scorpio. You can see there's the moon down there at 1458, virtually 15 degrees of Scorpio. The middle degrees are always considered to be the most powerful because all signs start at zero degrees and kind of peak in a wave at, until they get to 30 degrees. Okay, so that means right there, this is a more powerful eclipse. Now, the, I've also marked fixed stars here on this uh, chart. So you can see the moon is conjunct to a fixed star called Zubin el Janubi. I hope I pronounced that right, uh, which is a very kind of malefic, although most, I have to say that most uh, interpretations of the fixed stars, most of them are difficult. Um, and it's a south node. The most important thing is really that it's a south node lunar eclipse. Now, this is one of the few things, the nodes of the moon, are what creates all solar and lunar eclipses. And so this is very, very ancient astronomy, astrology, when they were one, also being a doctor was also part of that description. And NASA today still uses north and south nodal descriptions for the eclipses, which run in what's called Sero cycles, which repeat every 18 plus years. Now there's two different cycles. There's a metonic cycle, which is 19 years, and there's the solar cycle, which is 18. Um, 18 years plus right down to certain minutes and you can look up those as well but I'm not going to go into that right now I just want to mention that it's a south node eclipse which means it's a time to release in traditional Vedic astrology the north and south nodes the north node is called Rahu the south node is called Ketu they're always opposite each other there's the north node up there at four degrees Taurus south node at four degrees Scorpio so this is called the dragon's head so traditionally Ancient Chinese and Indians believe that a dragon was eating the sun, so they call it, it can be called draconic astrology. So if you like dragons and Game of Thrones and all that, there's the North Node, which represents what the collective is evolving towards, and the South Node, which represents past lives, traditionally what we're letting go of and leaving behind. So the qualities attributed to Scorpio or what's influencing this moon, but this is a time of of letting go. Okay, now Scorpio is a sign related to death and rebirth, all the biggies, I call it sex, money, power, control, secrets, mystery, it's related to the occult, anything dark, deep, forensics, also big finance. Okay, traditionally it has to do with inheritance as well, rebirth, resurrection. So the sign of Scorpio is governed by the planet Mars. Traditionally, here's Mars up here at 21 Cancer and Pluto, and there's Pluto retrograde, recently retrograde at zero degrees of Aquarius. So you can see they are opposite each other. Um, so they're very strongly involved. Now Mars is actually um, trining the moon a bit wide, but it's trining it. Now, Mars at 21 degrees Cancer. Uh, planets are considered to be stronger or weaker traditionally as well. Uh, Mars is considered weak in Cancer because it's considered to be exalted in Capricorn. And so Mars is kind of underwater. It is very much, Mars is the warrior planet. It's aggression, it's testosterone, it's macho. It represents uh, the masculine energy and everybody action defenses. So Mars in the home sign of the mother, the womb, the roots, the foundations, the ancestors underwater is very much passive aggressive. Okay, so there can be a lot of family arguments going on uh, as a result of this eclipse and just anger that's simmering below the surface, which is in danger of kind of bursting out, right? So you can be feeling excessively emotional because cancer is usually very sentimental and very nurturing and very mothering. And, you know, traditionally, again, this is very patriarchal stuff. Mars in a feminine sign is considered not strong, but I also see that Mars is picking up 
the need to be nurtured, needs to go home. He's like the wounded soldier. He's PTSD. He's going home. He needs chicken soup. He needs mom. He needs family. He needs support. He needs to heal. So for me, a lot of what this eclipse is about is that. Okay. Now, Pluto, zero degrees of Aquarius is also very important because zero degrees of Aquarius is where Jupiter and Saturn met December 21st, 2020, just before COVID, in their 20-year cycle. And this was a new beginning uh, for a 200-year cycle of Jupiter and Saturn meeting only in air signs. Okay, And the only time they met in air signs, uh, traditionally they were meeting um, in earth signs uh, before then. And for the last 200 years before that, and then the only time they moved into air signs was once in the beginning of like 81 when they met in Libra. And that was like a bit of a foreshadowing. So now that point, that degree is very, very powerful, zero degrees of Aquarius. So it can take us back um, to that time. So we may be reintegrating or may, there may be anger or people want to be freed up. Uh, and seeing things in a higher consciousness level because Pluto is moving retrograde. Uh, Pluto will move back into Capricorn and then pass Aquarius two or three more times, actually, before it finally enters Aquarius in late 2024. So you can see the tension. There's a lot of tension going on uh, at this eclipse. Now, the Sun at 14 degrees of Taurus is connected to Uranus. So Uranus conjunct the Sun. Now they don't make an exact conjunction till a few days after the eclipse, but Uranus conjunct the Sun brings this element of surprise and shock and awe and freedom and rebellion. Uranus is the modern ruler of Aquarius. Saturn is the traditional ruler of Aquarius. So Uranus conjunct the Sun highlights that need for real, physical, tangible, you know, Taurus is real for the money. Uh, so really big shakeups chaos in the money markets and the bull markets and Uranus rules crypto. So, you know, um, again, this can be things being very unstable, to say the least, um, in every way. And, you know, Taurus rules the throat, so people might be speaking in weird ways or, and literally the body. So your body can be feeling very off in a way. Of course, Uranus is opposite the moon. It might be very, very hard to sleep around this eclipse, or you could be feeling very exhausted. And again, that element of rebellion, I don't know if you've seen what's been going on in France, they're burning the country down as protests against Macron and his um, World Economic Forum cronies there, which is fine because the, you know, Pluto and Aquarius is definitely gonna be rebellion for the next 21 years. Um, so it's the machines against the humans, basically, because Aquarius is a human sign. We don't wanna be transhumans, okay. Um, Mercury is, of course, retrograde, speaking of communication. So Mercury is also in Taurus. So there's a lot of heavy Earth in this uh, eclipse. Mercury retrograde at 8 degrees of Taurus connected to the North Node. So that means we're going back. We're going to revisit um, ideas, things, you know, practical things. Of course, you know, Mercury retrograde is always about miscommunications. And my sense of it is because it's in Taurus, like practical things. My glasses just broke. Um, you know, money, things can be very chaotic right now. Like you expect to have a job, boom, it's gone. Um, so real estate, again, that's what Taurus rules. Money, finances, real estate, the body, everything sensuous. And Venus rules Taurus. Now Venus is over here at 27 degrees of Gemini, sitting on the North Star. And so, well, you could say in some ways Venus could be the star of the show because the North Star is like literally the cosmic GPS that we have to navigate around. You can locate the North Star very easily. If you go out at night, you look, it's off the tail of the Big Dipper. You, can, you can't miss it. It's the main pole star in the sky. So Venus in Gemini, well, can't make up our minds, can we? We want both things at once. We have lots of mental energy, which can also be exhausting. So that Taurus energy is being filtered through Venus. And so people are taking sides and there can be that sense of immaturity and kind of loose words or you know, kind of like poking the bull, kind of, you have to be careful about that, don't poke the bull by things you've said, okay? Um, but it is a good time to strike up maybe old conversations, of course, that's traditional with Mercury and Taurus, you might hear from old um, people you were in love relationships too, okay. Um, what else do we want to talk about here? Other aspects here. Psyche, the asteroid Psyche is connected to the moon, so that would activate our deep psychic energies. 
Um, so I did a big workshop yesterday, a live. If uh, you want to buy that workshop, you can. I explained what the whole energies of this eclipse is all about, but Scorpio, Scorpio in general, and then um, what all of the planets are all about, and also how to do all the releasing before the eclipse, because on a, a lunar eclipse or on a solar eclipse, you never make intentions, you don't do any magic. You sit and reflect and you only say prayers because the effects of everything you think, say, and do on an eclipse are magnified a hundred thousand times according to ancient Hindu spiritual beliefs and also Tibetan Buddhist beliefs. So, you know, I have always a lot of respect for the old traditions and you have to follow their lead, okay? Now, um, Ceres, the great mother, she's over here in Virgo. Now she rules Virgo because she is Demeter. She's opposite Neptune uh, in Pisces. So in a way that gives us the ability to ground more intuitively. Um, Neptune and Venus are in a square actually. So Neptune, Venus means again, there can be tension, but kind of excitement. Um, you know, talking about imagining, it's a good time to channel a romantic story or novel or write poetry because Neptune in Pisces is always super romantic. You're looking for your soulmate. Um, series there means you want to nurture your body. You want to be practical in all of this, okay? Psyche and series are in a sextile here, actually, and they're, they're nicely dealing with each other. Now, Jupiter, the planet of expansion, is at 27 degrees of Aries, and it is exactly sextile, which is a positive 60 degree angle to Venus. So this can be very nice, romantic, and a lot of astrologers are saying that kind of mitigates the eclipse, but I don't believe that because the eclipse always trumps every other aspect, even though they're all important and they're all involved. And I would say it's really the planetary ruler there, Mars and Cancer, being kind of weak and underground. So there can be unconscious shadows and, and lashing out and so watch your back it's kind of you know scorpio is always a bit paranoid um you know scorpios go through three different levels of transformation so at the lowest level you know when if you tell somebody you're a scorpio or if you have your moon in scorpio or your ascendant in scorpio or planets in scorpio they always kind of step back because they're reacting to the bad reputation that scorpio has for being the literally the scorpion and stinging people and being ruthless when they need um something you know they'll just use you okay but you know on a more evolved level scorpio feels all those feelings they want to be in control they want to manipulate they want what they want and they're obsessive of course um and they don't want to let go but they learn to rise above all of that okay now there will not be another eclipse uh in scorpio for another 18 years okay so this is a big deal there's also been two previous eclipses in this series that are affecting this one. So this is like the climax, the final degree. The previous Scorpio eclipses were at May 16th, 2022 at 25 Scorpio and October 25th, 2022 at two degrees of Scorpio. So you might want to think back about what was going on in your life at that time. And I'm really including uh, the November the 8th, the last election day in the US, the lunar eclipse at 16 degrees of Taurus, which is directly opposite where we are now. Now all solar and lunar eclipses follow, sorry, all lunar eclipses follow every six months, they go into, a, you know, the, uh, the opposition phase. So we're at the opposite phase from where we were November the 8th. Um, I mean, there was another eclipse in, in Taurus as well. Um, and there will be October 28th, there's going to be another eclipse in Taurus at, uh, on the 23rd at five degrees of Taurus. So where the North Node is now. So that one, October 28th, 23, at five degrees of Taurus is also a really important one because it's right pretty much where the North Node is now. So things that are seeded now, you might want to wait and see until October 28th until you really get the results. And especially because Mercury is retrograde, it's slowing things down, practical things, it's frustrating. Um, my intuition told me to tune into Sedna because we're dealing with a lot of water here uh, and a lot of earth. It's a very feminine kind of nature. You can see at the bottom here, there's a balance of the elements, a lot of water, a lot of earth. Um, Sedna is a dwarf planet. She is famous. She was named for the indigenous uh, goddess of the ocean and her story is very tragic and so the long and the short of it is her father tried to abandon her and they were out on a boat and she went overboard and he cut off her fingers and she sunk to the bottom of the ocean and she was grief struck of course by the being so um, abandoned by her father. Um, that she then, her fingers became all the sea creatures. So this is a mythological story 
Um, so then all of the whales, all of the dolphins, the seals, the, the walruses, the narwhals, all the fish in the sea are part of Sedna. So of course, because the Inuit people depended on all of those sea creatures to live, she is their most, most revered goddess. Um, and so aspects of whatever is deep in the unconscious, that Sedna, that deep fear of rejection, that we all carry it at the heart of it and all the water signs relate to the mother-child relationship. That's what I felt we needed to get to the bottom of, right? So Sedna there at 29 degrees of Taurus conjunct Algol, the most feared star in the sky. That's Medusa's head and also conjunct Juno, one of my favorite asteroids. I am writing a book about her. Juno is at two degrees of Gemini, very close to Sedna there. So we get a chance to kind of, you know, see both sides of an issue, okay? There's Lilith over there at 13 degrees of Taurus. She is squaring the sun and the moon. Um, and so she's very powerful as well. Um, and so Lilith and Leo is like, you know, really never compromising, really listening to your heart, really being very strong-willed. Okay, now this is also, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of fixed signs in this chart. So again, Scorpio's obsession. Um, this is a time to let go of any toxic relationships, elements, things that have been bugging you. Um, Jealousy, you know, all of that deep Scorpio stuff that, you know, we don't want to admit to are deep shadows that we all have. No matter how much work we've done, there there can still be eh, one more little thing that we have to scrape the bottom with. Um, and also there's Saturn in Pisces. So Saturn also in Pisces adding to the water element just past the Archangel Gabriel star there. And, you know, Saturn rules structure, it rules reality. Now Saturn in Pisces, of course, our reality is unreal. Okay, so there's Saturn in Pisces, also sextiling the North Node. So Saturn is helping us to tap into our intuition, to channel, and to let go. Because Pisces is all about letting go and surrender, surrendering our will. And yet there's this strong willpower thing going on here. Um, also Hecate, I thought about Hecate because she rules the three ways. Um, she's also there at nine degrees of Cancer, also sextiling Mercury. Uh, Vesta, the root word of investment, she's right in there too with the sun. And so Hecate gives us the ability to look in all directions at once. Pluto is also conjunct to the fixed star altar, which is a big eagle, a beautiful eagle. So we get to, our souls get to soar high from this big higher perspective. Okay, so I want to wish you all the best blessings for this eclipse. Remember um, not to do any intentions, just to pray. Um, traditionally, Buddhists chant Om Mani Padme Ham, or you can just do Oms, or just listen to some beautiful music. The um, the Gayatri mantra is something that you would also do. I particularly like the version of Richard Tyler and Stuart Wilde, who was my old spiritual teacher. Um, that's you can find that on YouTube. And also, this the the what I channeled, which was very powerful last night, is available to buy for only eleven dollars. So if you want to get in touch with me, I am at terratarot.com, wishing you all the best for the blessings. And if you're feeling really exhausted and overwhelmed by this, just remember that the effects of the eclipse will dissipate uh, later tomorrow afternoon. Okay, stay hydrated, sending you all the best blessings. If you want to get in touch with me, I'm at terratarot.com.